everyone. I'm here at my home studio. Um, been working on this painting behind me for a bit, but uh, we're going to continue our drawing lessons or drawing kind of experiments with um, doing a little bit more practice with citing proportion and scale, but this time using some color. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about your color materials to start with. Um, some of my favorite colored materials are um, colored pencil and gouache, or even water-soluble pencils. However, you do need to um, understand the differences between the different brands, the different grades, different types. Um, I find that it's really worth the investment that you put into getting a little bit more of a quality material. So I'll show you a little bit of, uh, you know, about um, some of those effects and what those materials look like. <laughs> So down here, I've got some stuff spread out. Um, first off, uh, colored pencils. So we're going to be citing and mapping with colored pencil to start. I often like to use um, kind of a range of a type of color, like maybe like these greens, for instance. Um, my favorite is definitely Prismacolor. So you can find student grade Prismacolor pencils but you really want to find um, a more of an artist grade pencil and it will have a lot more intense color for you. So um, I can take a little bit of this watercolor paper and just show you, you know, the effects. Like you can get a really nice intense color. So, you know, if you really want to experiment, you can certainly compare grades. I honestly don't, you know, buy the student grade color anymore. Um, so try it out. Colored pencils are pencils that have a core of colored pigment and protective casing made of wood. So while standard pencils have a core of graphite and clay, a core of most of the colored pencils is made of wax, pigments, additives, and binding, binding agents. So there are different types of colored pencils depending on their intended use. Artist grade pencils have higher concentrations of high quality pigments than student grade colored pencils. And then at the end, once we've had some more practice with citing proportion and scale, we're going to add some kind of gouache shadows. Um, but I wanted to show you a little bit about what it's like to look, work with gouache. Um, so I do have some gouache that, you know, I had from some other time, which is maybe not as good a quality as my favorite brand, which is Holbein. So Holbein, it is uh, a little bit pricey, um, so you can really tell a quality gouache probably more so even by the cost because of the high pigment content. So if we compare these two, and you look at my sheet here, uh, this top one here is more kind of like the lower quality grade, this is the higher quality grade. So if you look at each one of those individually, um, the one thing that I can point out to you is that the lower quality grade is going to have this sort of um, area where it kind of dissolves a little bit when you add water to it, whereas the higher quality gouache, even though I've added water to it, it remains consistent throughout the entire brush stroke. So this is lower quality, higher quality, lower quality, higher quality. And then this is them, you know, without as much water, with very little water added to them. And so um, you can see that the um, higher quality gouache has a lot more intense color, uh, higher sort of pigment content in that paint. The other thing that I really love to use, even though I'm not necessarily going to introduce it at this beginning level, is um, a water soluble pencil. So these ones are Derwent's like ink tense pencils. These are my absolute favorite. But again, a little bit of an investment of money. Um, so when I go and I often travel and use that for inspiration for my work, um, I bring these along because they're so easy to carry with you on site um, and draw, but then you just add some water to them later uh, to create kind of like both a drawing and a painterly effect in one piece. So you can see that's what's going on with these pieces here that I've done in the past. So that's something just as an idea to, you know, see, play around with, try out. So if I was going to draw with those, you know, I've got, you know, like this red one here. Um, 
it draws, you know, just like a regular kind of colored pencil, like a different color pencil. But then, you know, you take some water, which when I'm traveling, I always have a bottle of water with me. So it's really easy. And then you just, you know, paint into it and it becomes like a really beautiful painting, which has really intense color as well, which is why, you know, they have that ink tense name to them. Some of you probably seen these as well. These are pretty cool just a water brush, and this would be really easy to carry around as well if you're traveling, or even if you're just like on site somewhere and you have to make a drawing on the fly. So you can um, just paint into that and it becomes a little bit more easy to push around and, and play around with. So let's get going on a drawing and see what we can do with some of these materials and see how it feels to you if you haven't used this before. Add some water into some of them, leave others opaque, mix them, they, they mix just like a regular paint does. So gouache is a type of water soluble paint that unlike watercolor is opaque, so the white of the paper surface does not show through. The term gouache, so remember to pronounce it gouache, G-W-O-S-H, basically, uh, despite the odd spelling. Um, it's not gouch. Um, so uh, this was first used in France in the 18th century to describe a type of paint made from pigments bound in water-soluble gum, like watercolor, but with the addition of white pigment in order to make it opaque. Gouache forms a thicker layer of paint on the surface and does not allow the paper to show through. So traditional gouache is basically opaque watercolor. It is rewettable like watercolor and dries matte. So it has kind of a velvety look to it, which I enjoy. Gouache is easy to reproduce and is therefore a hit among illustrators as well as artists. Uh, you can add water it, uh, to it if you want to create a slight degree of transparency as well. So since gouache is a highly pigmented paint, a good indicator actually is of the quality is its price. Um, so it is worth the investment and, you know, you can get a reasonable uh, price if you just kind of do what I did, you know, get the primaries and then mix your own colors and it works really well. So here are all of the items that I'm going to be using for creating this next drawing. Um, some of them I'll use less or more and some of them, you know, you might switch out for different things depending on what you have. Um, I did have you order materials, so you should have most of this. Um, obviously our drawing sheet uh, of paper, you are going to tear this out like we have been. You have colored pencils. Um, you could potentially use a different set, but I did this sort of under the C set, which I like. Uh, our viewfinder that we made, a little bit of masking tape, eraser, pencil sharpener, cup for our shavings, and then a paintbrush. I have gouache. Yours might look a little bit different. Um, I just have red, yellow, and blue, and I mix my own colors. And then this is a cup of water. And then on the side down here, I have a palette. It basically could be a piece of paper um, just to mix up the gouache and, and use that later on. We'll do that for the last step. And then paper towels and our fabulous still life that you have set up with some nice lighting as well. Now well, I've got my sheet of paper on my hard board. Don't forget that. Tear it out of your sketchbook and my still life is in front of me. And I've got my viewfinder and I'm thinking, what composition am I gonna do for this piece? Mm, I think I see something pretty good through there. Um, so I think I'm pretty well ready. I can use that to help me decide on an interesting cropping. And, um, you know, if it helps to put a little bit of tape down on the edges of the corners of your paper, um, I did put like a little piece of tape on my still life, so I kind of remind myself that I'm not including all that upper space. If you need those little indicators, that can help as well, and I think I'm ready to go. So the three pencil colors that I've chosen are this sort of peachy color, um, an olive green, and actually like a dark purple, which I thought would be kind of interesting. So like we did before, I'm going to work with only one pencil at a time and set the other two aside. Lighter, lighter color first. And as we start, you know, remember the first thing is a gesture drawing, which is a very quick, speedy drawing, mapping out everything on your composition. And it's a good idea to also time yourself five minutes max, five minutes. 
So remember that a gesture drawing is a very just kind of quick response to what you're seeing. It doesn't matter whether you're using the figure or whether you're doing a still life. Just getting everything down at the, on the paper so that you're not confronted with a blank sheet any longer, which I find intimidating. Most people do. I think it's a good way to start to really establish a composition. It doesn't have to be perfect, but remember with a, a gesture, you're drawing through forms and getting a rough idea of their location in space. So even though I have rather quite crazy organic objects here, I have to remember that I am still working hard to create proper proportion and scale of all items throughout that space. So it might look like a bit of a massive mess to you. I'm gonna sharpen this real quick. I should have done that sooner. Pause my time and then I'll go again. Um, I am looking very carefully at items in relation to each other, but at this gesture stage, I'm getting just as much energy down on that paper as I can. The one thing that is fairly structured is my little teapot over here, or I don't know, creamer, whatever you want to call it. But these other organic items have obviously a different kind of linear quality to them, which I think will be interesting later on in the drawing. So this is the basis of all drawing. You know, you have to get used to doing this gesture first, getting that energy behind it. And like I said, I'm going to expect to see these lines behind your drawing to show me that you understand this process of developing a drawing in these individual layers from super fast response to much slower response in the end. Okay, I think I'm pretty good with that. Since I'm pretty well experienced, I might end up doing less than five minutes just because I'm used to this process for you. I'd say take the five minutes, make sure you've included every element in the piece. Don't forget something like I've done before, or maybe you saw the last video. <laughs> that happens for sure. Um, you know, think about where's the half line. The half line is kind of this line here. So I think that's good for my gesture. Next, I'm going to remove and take away my lightest colored pencil and put it aside and then pull out my mid-range colored pencil, which for me is this olive green. And I'm going to start working on siding proportion and scale. I'm going to do what's called organizational line. So this is where I'm going to be measuring, mapping out everything that I see in my still life as best as possible. So since I have this one object that is a bit more geometric, a little bit easier to get down in space, I'm going to get that first. So I know that I've mapped out my composition and I've looked through my viewfinder and I kind of get the sort of middle side, the middle of the composition. So if I look at my composition here, the middle is roughly about, you know, where that line is here. And I know that that basically slices that little kind of mini picture in half. So I know that half of it goes above and half of it below. So oftentimes to save myself time and energy and making sure that I get things down correctly is I'll put little tick marks here and there to get the right proportion and scale. So I use, remember, my pencil. I put it at the top of the object, put my thumb at the bottom, hold it up to my still life with my elbow straight, not bent. And then I take a look at that object. I've got the height down on my paper and I just move my uh, pencil horizontal to see if the width matches the height. And it does on the entire kind of larger sphere of the picture minus the handle. So then if I've got that like this on my paper, I turn it sideways. I've got one end here, one end here. Then I know that the sort of roundness of the picture fits within that area. So this goes up to the lip. I know that the lip kind of dips down and then the outer edge of the picture goes out. 
So once I get this roughly done in space, I'm then going to use that to map out everything else in my still life. So essentially you don't need a ruler, you need one object down in space and you use that to spatially analyze the rest of what you're trying to draw. So I'm not finishing out the picture. I'm not worried about the detail or the pattern or anything that's on it. I'm just getting the larger whole of it down properly. And I know that the handle kind of comes out to the side. I can't necessarily see all of it. I've got some of the leaves in the way, but it's totally okay to draw through another element that you know is gonna be in front of it, just to make sure you get that object behind correct in space and that it's all gonna sit well for you. There's also the top of, you know, the lip of this picture, which I can't entirely see, but I know that it opens, right? So I can do a bit of a ellipsis, a slight uh, kind of side oval here to suggest that I know that that's going to be there somewhere in space. So this type of drawing is not as fast as a gesture. It's a little bit slower, but it's still not entirely as slow as a contour line drawing. And also the quality of your line at this point, this is where you kind of get the sketchy lines to make sure that you're getting the proportion and scale before you really lay it down with your contours. So there's that picture, I'm pretty happy with it. So then I'm gonna use that to span out the rest of the, the composition. So I kind of look at the major players of in the still life. I've got this picture and I've got a big leaf here, I've got a big leaf here and kind of a rotten cucumber over here. So I'm gonna focus on those as kind of like my main items that are gonna set everything else in space. So I've got a, um, a leaf that basically begins kind of down here on, if I compare it, you know, the end of it to where the picture is, I know it ends right here, even though I don't necessarily have it in my gesture correctly. So this is where I'm starting to correct my gesture and get things down properly in space. And I know that that leaf is connected to another one with this sort of larger stem here. So there's one end of the leaf. And then I can also use this picture to see, is the, is the leaf the same size as the picture? So I'll hold that up with my hand, take a look, and then move it over without moving, bending my elbow to the leaf. And the leaf is just a little bit longer than the, the total of the picture. So I know the end of that is there, but the leaf actually goes more like out to here. Maybe kind of almost the middle, it's basically the middle of my drawing paper. And then you take a look at the height. Where's the height of the leaf in comparison to the picture? And I look at my still life, I hold my arm up again. I don't trust my intellectual side of my brain, basically at all. It just, it just like tends to wanna to generalize things way too much. So I'm always, you know, looking up, holding my arm up, comparing things in space in order for me to draw it correctly. That's really, really an important thing to learn. If you really wanna learn how to draw well, and be good at responding to what you're seeing. Okay, so I have that. So basically these are my tick marks that I've kind of mapped out. I've got a new leaf that starts in front of that other leaf. And that leaf actually is pretty close to being online with the bottom of that picture. So if I drew an organizational line over to the side, then I know that that other leaf basically kind of starts slightly underneath that. And then I know that that can go there. And then the beginning of it is basically halfway across this other leaf. So the second leaf begins there, horizontal there. This leaf begins here, up through here. And then I know that, you know, this leaf just barely touches on that picture. And so I've basically created a box within which I know that that element is going to sit. Even though the leaf itself is like really looks, it looks complicated and it might like, you know, make you feel a little bit intimidated. But honestly, if you map things out like this, 
it will in the end be quite easy and you'll get it down in space correctly and it'll look good. So this is how I do pretty much all of the drawing. And if I just put these little tick marks with, for everything I draw, I haven't wasted time or energy putting details in that are wrong that I'll have to erase and change. I've just said, okay, here's this general area within which um, this element is going to sit. And so then from there, I can, you know, fairly, you know, easily get these objects down in space. Maybe this stem, I think, goes up a little bit. And with these leaves, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trusting my brain to just interpret it because they're a bit complicated. So I have to really force myself to make sure I take those measurements and compare, like I'm looking at the different parts of the leaf and where they sit in relation to the other elements. Remember, you're always looking at the spaces between things. And I'll proceed with continuing in the same manner. I'm always um, putting little tick marks, sketching things in, comparing with my pencil, you know, measuring this, that without bending my elbow, sometimes looking through my viewfinder to make sure I've got things um, looking correct in terms of space, and then building the whole drawing from there with organizational lines. So as you're working on this drawing, remember important um, aspects of what you're doing at this point. You're creating these organizational lines. And so organizational line provides the framework for a drawing. So this framework can be compared with the armature upon which a sculptor might mold clay or scaffolding of a building. Organizational line takes measure. They extend into space. They too are transparent, though we're drawing them on our paper. They cut through forms. Organizational lines relate background shapes to objects. They organize the composition. They take measurement of height, width, and the depth of the objects and the space that they occupy. And then related to this, what we're doing is sighting. And so this is the visual measurements of objects and spaces between objects. And structural line is line that helps to locate objects in relation to other objects and, in, and to the space that they occupy. You know, you're comparing things with one another and drawing straight across on your paper. And then as you're doing this, what you're doing is sighting. And basically, you know, as I was showing you, you hold your arm up, you close your eye to diminish the depth perception and hold the pencil at arm's leg length and don't bend your elbow. And so with this, you can measure the height and width of each object and make comparisons between objects. It's an important device in training yourself to quickly register proper proportion. And it's really indispensable in terms of an aid for learning to translate three-dimensional objects onto a two-dimensional surface. Um, and remember, as you're drawing, draw through forms, search out underlying structures, build on the energy of the gesture and the drawing Always remember you should develop it as a whole from gesture and mapping out proportion and scale. So the drawing should have the ability to change because you're constantly reassessing what you see. Um, it should build up as a whole. And if at any point, like I said, hey, stop this drawing, you know, would the whole drawing have a sense of the same attention given across it? Now that I've done a good amount of organizational line, I'm going to put that green pencil aside and go in with my darker purple. I'm going to slow way down. I'm going to really focus and concentrate on contour line. So I'm going to put down one kind of strong, confident line, knowing that I've mapped out my proportions already. I am leaving those other lines that I had in there previously. So you can see the process that I've gone through with this drawing. And I'm going to get my eye and my hand working together, thinking about, you know, my line quality. That's kind of fun when you're working with something like this, like these leaves or organic matter that you can think about the sort of quality of the line of the edges of the sort of like crumbling leaves or whatever else you're drawing. You can meditate, turn on like something you want to watch or listen to and really focus on what you're doing. So 
with um, my imagery, you might have noticed that as an artist, I've lately been making these paintings of my weeds or other kinds of weeds as kind of a metaphor for human struggle. And so I decided to, you know, draw some weeds for y'all for this demo, kind of get my own personal um, art practice in. So you understand that this, everything that I'm doing here applies to everything that I do as a practicing artist. So I think you'll find that this class is not just, you know, an assignment that it is stuff that is going to help you for your future career as an artist or, you know, as someone who appreciates the arts, who likes to make art on their own, you might end up, you know, doing it on the side if, if it's not your main career per se. Okay, so I have finished my um, slow contour drawing and now I'm going to grab my gouache. I'm actually going to just mix up one color. So if you have a set with more than just red, yellow, blue, you can choose a color that you think would look nice to kind of finish this off with shadows. I think maybe I'll mix up a brownish kind of purple or color with my gouache and see how it looks. So you don't need a lot of this. We're just going to do like we have done with our last drawing and focus on shadows and not necessarily on value with regarding to coloring the whole piece. We're just going to do shadows to give it some accent, some visual interest beyond the line work that we've established here. Okay, so I'll try to mix that up. Having some water on the side is important. So I have my color ready to go. And you know, as I mentioned before, gouache is kind of an opaque watercolor. It's fun to use the withdrawing to give some color create a little bit of a sense of painterly effect. I need to dip in quite a bit with my water so it's not too dark for me. I can use a paper towel to help lighten it up a bit. So I'm just looking at the shadows that are cast 
from the lighting that I set up here on my still life and using that to you know create some visual interest some sense of um, highlighting certain areas right it's a bit of fun I've got these nice brushes that even though it's a large brush I can just use the very tip of it So look carefully for those cast shadows. Slow down and really observe what you're looking at. And this will give your drawing a little bit of finish. A little bit of sense of space. everyone great job on this drawing today i hope you'll join me again next time for another fun and interesting and enlightening hopefully uh, art demo thanks